Amazonia is the world's largest tropical rainforest, a home for more than a half of all plant and animal species, and it's the very place that hosts the largest number of primitive tribes on planet Earth. In the previous episode of The World Inside Out, we took a trip to Ecuadorian part of Amazonian rainforest to see the world's cruelest tribes, the Waurani. It feels like an adventure, and I'm already sensing that I won't get bored here. We took a long journey down the river and passed through the hazardous zone of incontacted people, where the indigenous tribes keep on killing all intruders even these days. They must surely know that we're here, in their land. To the witnesses of freezing assault. My husband was impaled with a spear. They just held him still like that, blood everywhere. We learned some shocking details. They killed about 60 persons. They spared only two little girls. Well, my friends, our trip through the River Amazon Basin in Ecuador continues. We've been in this boat for three days in a row. We've already had lots of incredible and unforgettable encounters, but the most exciting stuff lies ahead. Today we're going to get to the most remote and famous settlement of the Vaurani called Bameno. We're approaching the place we have been looking forward to. This is Bameno. The World Inside Out with Mitro Komaro, Ecuador. We've been greeted by naked people. The nude Vaurani are lining up along the bank. At first glance, their behavior is not aggressive. We are yet to learn if they are really as cruel as people say. It's hard to imagine that back in the 20th century, Vaurani were killing all intruders that would venture into their lands. These days, the tribe was split into those who still hide in the forest and kill foreigners and those who have already set up contacts with the outer world and look happy to greet the guests. These are the Vaurani, very colorful. Thank you, Vaponi Daureki. Vaponi Daureki, hi everyone. So, how are you doing? All right. Can I shake hands with you? You can. Vaponi, I can. All men are naked. Their tools are tied up with strings. Glad to see you. So are we. We were worried a lot when you were gone for so long. I guess you thought they might kill us somewhere. We expected the worst. The sun set twice and you didn't come back. Our guides are native to this settlement. They'd warned their tribesmen of our arrival beforehand, so they were expecting us. How can one fear for us if Ginto with us? And Miguel too. Only why do they look so much different? I guess they are from another tribe. Look at yourselves and Antham. I think they don't look decent. In fact, my mission is to find out if your casual lifestyle is this one or that one. I always go naked. Check this out. See the traces of the hammock. The hammock. Here's the proof. And I couldn't understand why he's showing his rear to me. He's making me see the traces of the hammock on his back. That means he really goes naked. Our laws force us to blur those places, but you can use your imagination. Every man has his male part pressed against the belly and tied with a string. It's also stretching up. It must hurt, huh? No, it's just like your underpants. Like my underpants, right? You know, I'm not married. Why didn't you take your sister along for me? My sister is married. That's why. What makes all people around the world alike is lots of bachelors looking for wives and asking for foreign women. Here you can see the two coolest bachelors of the Karawai tribe. We're going to your land to get married. Dear Ukrainian girls, this man is looking for a wife. If you fancy him, come to visit a Vaurani tribe. What's your name? My name is Kaminta. How old are you? I don't know. Okay, what kind of wife do you want? A pretty one, plum and tall. Pretty, plum and tall. Well, girls, see for yourselves. Come in free to pick up. 
I want a wife too. Come to the land of Valrani if you want to stay here. Just invite the girls to see you guys. Say welcome in Ukrainian. No, it's not the way to get a wife. Wow, a monkey. Fancy that. Just look at it. Hello. Just look what fun it is. I'm starting to like it here. It is your pet? Yes. It's got a name. It's Gato. I'm not going to hurt you. Don't yell at me. Monkeys run about here like cats and dogs in our places. It's tame. See a child playing with it. The natives' friendly attitude makes me happy. It's obvious they had visitors before. Time to unload our boats. We brought foodstuff and gifts for the whole tribe. 50 kilos of rice. Hello! Catch the rice! Thank you so much! Wait, there's more! We were greeted by naked people only. Now see how many dressed-up ones are coming up. Looks like the civilization has gotten here as well. It's now clear why the natives were greeting us naked. They appear in their traditional look to visitors and tourists and then put on shorts and t-shirts as they are comfortable. Man, can you match it is here? Pots and pants for women. And these are for kids. Here you are. I've got enough for you all. Anyone plays soccer here? Catch it, guys. And of course, candy for the little ones. Who is the boss there? Panty and Campari are. Hello, Panty. Panty is the village elder. He speaks Spanish too. You have several leaders, or is there the biggest one? Campari is the top boss. You ought to meet him. The first thing to do for someone who's arrived and plans to stay with the tribe is to meet the chief. So we're on our way to the village top boss. Chief Campari lives in a hut on the edge of Bermano with his wife Minema. Good afternoon. My name is Dima. It's Dima. My name is Dima. It's Dima. Dima. Right. His hearing is bad. What's your name? My name is Kemperi. Kemperi Yuitoi. Kemperi Yuitoi, okay. Nice to meet you. Chief Kemperi is the oldest and the most respected denizen of Pemano. They say he's more than 120 years old, but no one knows his precise age. The Valrani don't celebrate birthdays, as they don't know the dates of their births. Yet, everyone knows for sure that Kemperi was born back in the times when all the Valrani were uncontacted. I want to inquire, as the oldest member of your tribe, whether you're a hundred years old or more, to get to know how your tribe came into contact with the civilization and how its life changed afterwards. My tribe began to communicate with the outer world not so long ago. I still remember the times when we were killing foreigners. Once we killed a lot of white men who were entering our wood. We hid in the foliage and then dealt a surprise attack with spears. Two or three were killed on the spot. The rest were crying and yelling. Other foreigners ran up, but seeing us, they all fled in terror. We killed those who lagged behind and we came back home satisfied. My brother Goma was happy because that was the way an assault should be. The invaders must learn a lesson not to ruin our nature. It's striking to see the emotion Kimperi has while describing the details of the massacre. He must have told the story to the young Valrani a lot of times, but even now he shares the horrifying memories with pleasure and pride. You saw him talking with a smile. Oh, that was just normal to him. How did those others, non Vauranis, look? Their clothes looked like yours. They had some badges on their chests. And their skin color was like yours too. Were those people armed? Yes, they had weapons. Invaders were killing us too. If they spotted a Vaurani in the woods, they just started shooting. 
What about the people who simply wandered on your land? Did you kill those too? The unnamed ones who weren't logging. People like us. If someone came to our land, we tried to drive them away at once. We didn't care for the reason why they came here. We sprang out of the woods and killed them with our spears. While I'm listening to this story, I'm starting to realize that it's true that the Warani are the cruelest tribe on the earth. Do you remember how many people you killed personally? They have no words for numbers. Two. Two more. They just use fingers. They can't read, they can't write, they don't know how to count either, only show the number of the killed with fingers. Sixteen. When your husband killed someone, did he come back home and boast about that to you? Like, honey, I killed two or four today, or something. Usually, when men went out killing, me and other women would hide away in the woods nearby and wait for them to come back and tell us everything. Did you approve of killing those people, or was just regular stuff for you and you didn't even give it a thought if it was good or bad? It was part of our life. Everyone killed, so we had no problems with that. This kind of attitude to killing was shared by all the uncontacted Valrani people. Even these days, the modern contacted tribesmen have not really changed their mindset. Our culture fosters freedom of self-expression, entertainment and freedom of killing. So young people are starting low and trying to merge the two worlds together. Today, as the times have changed and you no longer kill visitors, do you have any regrets or hard feelings towards your past? What do you think about it? I have no regrets at all. Back then, we protected our land and avenged our murdered brothers. When did you come to realize that other people who came to your land must not be killed? What was the breaking point? We had missionaries visiting who told us that we must not kill and we must live in peace. It's important to note that the process of becoming contacted was really long for the people of the forest and it took numerous lives of those who tried to teach them the most important commandment Thou shalt not kill. The most tragic attempt of Valrani life was Operation Oka. We'll tell you more about the first contacts and walk in the footsteps of the missionaries to discover the facts that simply shock. It looks like you were the witness of two different periods or eras of lifestyles. You both lived in the old uncontacted world and are living in the new one. Which one is better? Although we have come into contact with the world, I still prefer the quiet and peaceful life in the forest. I would never agree to move to the city. People die soon there. How many uncontacted groups you think there are now? I mean, the people who don't contact civilization and still kill like you used to do. We're positive that they exist. I don't know how many they are, but there were lots of my relatives who chose to stay isolated. I still know nothing about their fate. If you could give those people advice, would you tell them to contact the outer world or stay uncontacted? Me? I managed to adapt to a new life, but the uncontacted ones had better to left alone. It was their own choice not to get involved with the civilization and remain free. We have to respect their choice. Well, but the saddest part is they continue to kill, you know. The last time it was in 2016. Yes, when it happened, it was a heavy blow to us all. Many of us wanted to avenge them, go to the jungle and find the killers, but I told the people of Banemo that they shouldn't do that, as there will be even more blood as the result. Now you see, the man who had killed 16 persons with his spare himself later asked the community not to kill and not to avenge deaths because times had changed. Thank you for that decision. It was totally natural thing to kill a foreigner for the Vavarani. They lived by the laws of the jungle. To kill intruders was as normal for them as it's to set a mouse trap in the pantry of us. They never felt any remorse. They were simply protecting their homes and their land. In rarest cases, they could accept an intruder into their tribe. Then they would give him a compulsory Vavarani name. He became one of the tribe and would not fear death by despair any longer. I'll give you a name too. What is it? Anwar. 
so I'm Anwar now. It was my brother's name. Now you're going to be Anwar. Why Anwar? It's the name they'd give to great warriors. Men who bore this name were the best leaders and chiefs. The fact that the chief gave me a Valrani name means that I've been accepted in the tribe and we were allowed to stay here. First of all, the women of the tribe showed me where they get food. There are no grocery stores in the jungle. The girls are ready to go. Where are you going? We're going all together to the place where yucca grows. We'll be harvesting. Yucca is edible tubers that look like potatoes. It's staple food for more than 500 million people around the world. Here's your axe. This one's for me, right? Well, don't hold it like this, turn it around. It's okay, I won't cut myself. Like this, right? Let's make a contest. Your names, please. And the little one. Are you coming with us? And my name is Anva. Anva, you must be strong. You'll be a great harvester. Usually only Valrani women harvest yucca. But to see where the inhabitants of Bemana get their groceries, I ask them to take me to their forest supermarket. Look what the girls are wearing. Shorts and panties. Some put on their traditional beds on their waist too. See how big a team we've got. Here's the girl leaders. And there are lots of children over there. Hi, everyone! They dubbed you Anwar, so you have to wear no boots and no barefoot. Wait, let Anwar get used to it. Just wait! Each Valrani family owns a sort of vegetable garden in the jungle near the settlement. Two minutes later, we land. Need help, girls? It's a custom with us to help ladies of a vehicle. Take my hand, babe. Hop. Atta girl. Since I am the only man in this company today, I'll try to do my best. Now, European tourists would say, oh, the wild rainforest, adventure time. But in fact, it's just a casual walk to a vegetal patch. The Valrani girls use their machetes. Do you plant your yucca or does it grow here by itself? We planted it here about a year ago. Normally a yucca field would look like this, but it's all different with the Valrani. Within a year, the yucca plants get lost among the jungle vegetation. So before gathering the crop, one has to find it. Just look at this wooden machete. It's handmade and it works. A simple wood plant, but it cuts off the leaves outright. It works! Previously, we only used wooden machetes, but they're hard to use as they're not really sharp. We have to apply great force. Modern machetes that you have brought are much better. Let me compare. Wow, just one blow. This one's better for sure. Tell me why there's 30 of you here if only two or three are actually working. We always go to the forest in large groups in case of hazardous wild beasts nearby. Bone beasts attack a large group. If we make a lot of noise, they stay away. So it's all about making noise. There are jaguars, anacondas, and wild boars in the forest, so it's safe to make as much noise as possible. Look, this is yucca. Ah, that's what is it. You find a tree like this, and all you got to do is pull its root out. It's easy to find the right one. It has a lot of blunt thorns at pretty large distance from one another. Cool. I ate yucca a lot of times in various countries, but it's the first time I'm harvesting it. Here we go. This is yucca. The notary South American potatoes, as it were. Really cool. It's the first time I'm pulling it up. Now I need to prove this part. Do I have to cut it? Is that what you took me here for? I thought it would be a walk in the park in the company of pretty girls. 
We normally come here without men and do it all by ourselves. Let me show you how to do it. Just let me. Oh my god, no, I can't let you do it. No way, it breaks my heart to see a girl toiling like this. You're smaller than this ex. Yes. So, am I a real Anva? Anva. You know, Anva sounds like a god's name. Now you're a true Anva. I'm just kidding. Let's keep working. Worms. Do you eat them? Yuck, you can't eat this. I will. Throw it away. Other tribes eat worms. I've seen it. Be quick. If you talk all the time, we won't be done before sunset. Wow, that's a huge root. Really huge. Come on, pull it. Here come the taters. Who's up for some fries? Look, we'll cook this big yuca tomorrow with the monkey. And this one we used to make chicha today. I hope you won't roast that sweet little monkey that runs around your village. No, Garter is our pet. We don't eat pets. Tomorrow you'll go hunting with a man and find some other one. Joking aside, they really eat monkeys here. It's traditional food for many tribes. We've seen it before in Brazil. And I think they do it here too. After you've worked a lot and gotten tired, you have to eat a little yuca. Like our potatoes, yuca is rich in starch. That's pure carb that quickly recharges you with energy. Nothing standing in some earth I've swallowed. The root test is great. It's quite pleasant to eat. I'd compare its texture to very soft nuts. If you used to pick and ripe walnuts as kids, you must remember those back stains on your fingers afterwards. And you must recognize the taste. It's fun. The Amazonian vegetable garden is a miraculous place where any weed might turn out to be a treat. Kiddies are known at sugarcane. May I try? It's really easy to eat. You bite off the skin and you get a sort of candy inside. A nice way to tame your thirst if you're in the wild forest. And a desert too. I can't eat it like you do. See, I've got no teeth. Let me peel it for you. Here you are. <laughs> One more way to eat it is to wring it like laundry to get the juice out. Mm. Yummy! After a short break, the women began an unusual ritual that they perform every time they go to pick yuca. They spit on the arms on all little girls and smear them with mud gather it from the roots. It's symbolic. It means that the crop will be as rich as today when the girl grows up. They don't do it to boys, only girls. The female group does everything very fast. While part of them were smearing mud on girls' arms, or they have already made baskets for yucca from palm leaves. Can't we just put the roots on our shoulders like this and walk back home? You'd better cut off the stem. Why take whole things we don't need? Here we go, into the basket. All things are makeshift. What's the liana for? We use liana to hold the basket on the head top. How's that? Will it hold? I must admit it's pretty heavy. About 20 kilos. Now let's see. Here's our harvest. A few baskets of yuca. What hasn't fit in the baskets, women carry home in even more curious way. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing a new elegant shoulder bag by the Vaurani. The local Dolce & Gabbana. Looks great. Must be like 35. No, I can't lift it. You're going to take it? You can do it. Okay, so you take it and I'll carry yours. Wow. I must say it's no fun. A 10 kilo backpack on your shoulders is nothing compared to the same weight on your head. You're heroes, girls, carrying such weight. You're a great worker too, well done. Let's go.
It's not a job for women, I have to say. To make things worse, the Vaurani women are petite and fragile. I can't imagine how they carry such weight all the time. Look at the girl in front of me. Her basket is at least 20 kilos, and there is a child under her arm too, and she's walking easily. Things that seem unusual to us are just regular everyday life for the Vaurani. Repeat after me. Like this, right? After you carry something heavy, you have to do this to relax your neck. Our friendly Vaurani team is coming back to the tribe to process the harvested yuca. Part of it will be made into the most popular dish of the region, called chicha. The rest might be cooked in a number of ways – by frying, boiling, steaming, braising. Then they eat it with meat. There are a lot of free sides. Greetings, Chief. Put the basket over there. Excuse me. Why do you make your women do such hard work? It's considered women's job here. They plant you and harvest it, and the men's job is to light up the fire and wait. See, my friends, the village elder just sits here and watches the pot boil. Then he's like, put the taters in here. That's a man's job. Girls, thank you for this jungle outing. I liked it a lot. You're true heroes. Let me shake your hands. You're so strong. Thanks. We go on to cook the Vaurani's main course, chicha. We'll see later what kind of food it is. The way to cook it is really, really weird. In the decade of my wandering around the globe and eating all kinds of yuca, I never tested anything like this. I never even imagined it might exist. Firstly, you have to peel yuca like we peel potatoes. Some women took modern knives. But as for me, they wanted to make it more challenging, and I got the traditional wooden machete. But practice makes perfect. Tell me, why do it so nicely, and why is so messy? What's the trick? You know the secret? You have knock off the peel, not hit the yuca itself. Show me the right way. You peel it off like this. I see. Just take off the upper layer. The root is so smooth under it. Would you rather wash yuca and drop it into the pot? I got the hint. My opinion's so bad that you wouldn't trust me with it. What I understand about it is that we're working and the elder is just lying in his hammock. Are you cool? Wanna give us a hand? I'm having rest. I see. Okay, no problem. This tribe has all things strictly shared between men and women. Why didn't you take your women alone? Next time you visit us, bring your women here. They'll help us cook. Why women? I've got only one wife. Bring your sister then. Okay, next time I'll take my sister, my wife and my mom. What about my mother-in-law? Of course, I'll take them all. Next time we'll all come here to Ecuador to cook your potatoes. May I stroke you a little? Won't your wife get mad? Yes, you may, no problem. My wife won't be jealous. In our culture, we don't mind touching married men. We can speak and joke with them. We can sing ye the song about Anva, if you like. Okay, go ahead. They hummus the song about Anva. I'll repeat after you. What does it mean? It's the song about Anva. Men sing it when women work. What's with the ring on your finger? The ring means that I have a wife. She wears a ring too. When we get married, we exchange rings. Never heard of this? It's gold. Can I have it? No, I can't give it to you. My wife won't let me in our home after that. It's the most precious thing in our family, a symbol of our marriage. If you have a wedding ring, you have a wife. The rings connect husband and wife together. Look at the cameraman hand. Sasha, he's got one too. On the same finger. 
I want it too. You could have a ring, sure, but it's just a symbol of love and marriage. What did your husband give to you on your wedding day? Mine did give me anything. Nothing at all. We cooked some chicha and had a feast, that's all. Now look, we have this ring once in a lifetime. And you eat chicha every day. It's like a daily wedding feast. So you could choose between one ring in your lifetime and chicha every day. What would you choose? To tell you the truth, I'm afraid that the ring may get stuck somewhere when I do my work and I lose a finger or some animal may grab me by it. How do you celebrate weddings? What happens at your husband and your ceremony? When a mother knows that her daughter is ready for marriage, she starts looking for a husband for her. He has to be a good hunter, strong and lucky. It's mother who decides on a husband for a girl. So no one asked you. Mother just brings in a guy and says, here's your husband. Yes, no romance. Oh, arranged. I don't know about others, but my parents decided that it would be better for me. And how was it with you? My parents and my brother made a decision for me. And what about you girls? My mom and dad chose my husband. So it's your relatives who decide for you anyway. There's a girl here who also went to Harvest Yuka with us today, all dressed in modern fashion. I'd like to know how it was in your family. We are a big family. They're my cousins and she's my aunt. When the time came, we all got together and made a decision on the best husband for me. See how interesting it is. Sometimes the whole community gets together and your friends and your family Choose your future spouse. By the way, you mentioned an important thing. You all here are related in some way. Do you intermarry within your community or do you try to find a match outside your own bribe? Previously, marriages were made only within the community. These days, we have more opportunities, of course. We can travel around and find ourselves spouses in other settlements. Which way do you prefer? You must know that marriages between relatives are not so good for the offspring. Traditionally, we have to marry the man of our own clan, so it would be better if my child, say, marries a child of my brother. One more remark. When I talked to you before, you deceived me. You told me that you were looking for a bride. I'm not married. You didn't. You bring your sister here for me. And now you're stalking this girl foot so gently. I guess you're not looking for a bride anymore. <laughs> She's my niece. Your niece, right? You see, they have their own way to share love in the tribe. Caressing a niece foot is no more than showing care and respect. It's quite casual here. It's nothing but massage. It feels good for both of us. I'm talking to everyone. Do find him a bride, or I'll find one. Well, we had some fun, peeled some potatoes, and now we're waiting for them to get cooked. The pot is boiling, the leaves on top work as a lid. When the taters are done, you'll see the main secret of the most important dish of the Vaurani people. 40 minutes have passed and yuca's done. Let's try it cooked. Boiled yuca tastes exactly like potatoes. It's great. I can stop eating it just like this. Yuca is not only tasty, but also good for your health. It's full of vitamins and antioxidants, but for the Vaurani, it's not enough to just boil it. It's only semi-finished. It has yet to turn into the most unusual dish one can try nowhere but here. Chicha is the Vaurani's traditional treat, the top staple food, something like borscht for Ecuadorian natives. It's both food and drink, as well as their main culinary pride. They have it on weekdays and holidays. Men always take chicha along when they go hunting. What have you just done? Why did you spit on the common pot? You have to chew yuca to make it sweet. Yes, you heard that right. They all put yuca in their mouth. Chew it, but don't swallow it. They spit it back into the pot. This is the main secret of making chicha. The dish is considered done when all the roots are well chewed, spat back and set aside for some time to ferment. If you leave chicha like that for several days, it will turn into a low-alcohol drink, and the non-alcoholic version will be ready the next day. 
My god, it looks gross. Just chew it well to make yuca soft, and then spit it in the pot. Gotta chew it well to make it soft. It's going to taste great tomorrow. Yummy yum! Tell me why they invented this recipe. Why do you have to chew and spit it? If you don't chew the yuca, then chicha will get dry and tasteless. It's all about amylase contained in our saliva. It turns any starch products into glucose, or simply put, into sugar. That doesn't only make the dish tastier, but also triggers fermentation. You know, we have a saying about someone who is too lazy. Do I have to chew your food for you? But with the Vavroni, it acquires a new sense. New sense. See, my friends, we wear masks, use sanitizers and social distancing, and here they simply spit in the common pot and then eat from it all together. On the one hand, such anti-sanitary way opens the road to spread numerous disease. On the other hand, people who have been spitting in the same pot and eating out of it for centuries already have the same set of bacteria in their bodies. This is how the Vauronis collective immunity is formed. They have mixed chewed stuff with unchewed one. So when you pick it up, you don't know if it has been chewed before or not. I hope you guys are not eating now, and I'm about to eat this. Let's set it aside for a night, and tomorrow we'll get perfect teacher, and you need to get a good sleep. You're going hunting with the man tomorrow. If you're lucky, you'll get us a monkey. That's how it is. It's hunting in the morning. Girls, thank you for this day, and for the new information. Quite shocking. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. Good night, everyone. Bye. The night accommodation surpassed all my expectations. They keep a large guest house in which they set up tents for us. This is my bedroom. It's the first time I have so much comfort on the whole time of my tribal expeditions. So, a huge room under the roof, a penthouse indeed. Usually, visiting wild tribes means walking through virgin forests and spending night without any convenience next to the naked or half-naked masters of the land. Tribal people are often astonished by the very fact of a white person coming over. They try to examine us, to touch us. They are a bit scared of us. All in all, they know little of civilization and comfort. I don't know what a car is or if there's anything beyond this forest. Here with the Valrani people, who ceased to be wild only half a century ago, they're up to more surprises. I'm coming out of the tribal hotel to have a little look around. We had a stunningly beautiful sunrise today. You know, it feels great to wake up in a tribal settlement considering our previous experience and walk into this nice shower cabin to refresh yourself. There's a toilet too, the kind I'm used to. See, water's running all right, so our conversation today is not the one we normally have in the tribes. It's not about survival in the virgin rainforests of the river Amazon, but rather about the merits and demerits of civilization. Is it good or bad when it arrives? Bamana is a large Bairani community, circled with the woods from all sides, but one of them has access to the river. There are about 150 persons living here. The closest big city is more than 100 miles away across wild forest. Being so far from civilization, the living conditions of the tribe astonished us the most. Look what there under my feet, a concrete path, all solid and durable. They made it not to walk on slippery clay when it rains. I've never seen it in tribal settlements before, even though I travel it a lot. There are numerous modern-style houses. People are trying to keep with the time, so I guess we can call them modern navities. They've got a school, a guest house for explorers and doctors and other visitors, and it's not enough.
I noticed that there's a faucet like this near every house, complete with a water counter. Do you have to pay for your water supply? The government set up a solar-powered water supply station two miles away from here. We don't pay for the water. The counters are merely for us to see how much we consume. Is it potable water, or should we rather have it filtered first? It's water from the river. We can drink it all right, but visitors had better filter it. Your tribe is really impressive. Please show me all the convenience you have got. I can see a solar panel over there. This one powers the radio. We've got plenty of them here. Solar panels are the easiest way to get power in the rainforest. You just put it in the open space and you can switch on the light at night. It's you, the solar panels, that Bamana has got the things available in a place as wild as this. Look, a Wi-Fi router. Okay, online here. Yeah. Just a reminder, there's a hundred miles of virgin rainforest around, no mobile connection, but they're online. There's the miracles of civilization. Now look, there's two Wi-Fi networks available. Cool is all I can say about it. They got a small radio station here too. It's for you to talk to other tribes, right? Yes, it's for keeping connection between settlements. And here's another great thing, a water filter. They pour in river water in here, and then you open this tap and get a refreshing drink. I got some in the mug, but I drink it the way they do it in India. From my lips not to touch the mug or the have drunk from. Electricity, internet and water supply, that's some civilized tribe. But wait for something even more stunning. In this Bauruni settlement, you can just walk out of the woods and see a plane, and people standing around it, admiring. The main landmark in Bameno is the 500 meters long aircraft runway. Now and then, a plane arrives, bringing in doctors, scientists, explorers and visitors. Natives themselves fly only in extremely rare cases. Normally, they get to the settlements by the river as we did. Natives love to gather there to watch the plane land and take off. Have you ever flown it? Only once in my life. How was it? Great. Did you? Also once, it was terribly scary. We near fly fell down. Is that what it felt like? Was it shaken? It was a lot. There is the only one question remaining. How did a runway this big could emerge in the midst of the rainforest? We ask him the elders. Back in the 1950s, they lugged wood here and built the runway. They were going to keep an oil depot here. They had armed security service, and our fathers won back this land from the oil company. We killed a lot of them. Let's compare the forces. How many of you were there, and how many were the military men, oil workers and loggers? There were 10 of our men, and more than 40 of theirs, including 26 armed. How did 10 men with spears manage to win 26 men with firearms? Our father said, spears are stronger than tribe. Also, we dealt surprise attacks. Our men knew how to move through the forest silently and attack without sound. Their men were scared by unexpected assaults. They ran, tripped and fell. We killed them with our spears easily. Only two of ours were wounded. When our fathers came back a month later, the depot had already been deserted, and they decided to settle here along the runway. It looks like the man has got everything – electricity, internet access and water supply. The government provides convenience for the natives so that they were able to develop tourism in future. This seems to be the only way to earn money in this wilderness, but the natives prefer to live the life their ancestors lived for centuries. On the next episode, we'll touch upon the biggest secrets of the Amazonian natives, the lethal curare and barbasco poisons. Your poison is binding over, put out the fire! A teaspoonful of this poison will kill a person on the spot. Does it kill fast? In two or three minutes. Scary.
will unveil the secret of the poisoned arrows that kept Europeans in horror for centuries. Warm blood dissolves dry poison and it starts acting. We'll even test the poison on ourselves. Poison's really tried. One of the deadliest poisons on the earth. The world inside out with Dmitry Komarov.